in pursuit of health and wisdom. Sapio with Buck Joffrey. Welcome back to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. This is Buck Joffrey, and today my guest is Dr. Anoop Kumar. He is a co-founder and CEO of Health Revolution. Uh, he's an author of a few books. Uh, the first one, Is This a Dream? Reflections on the Awakening Mind. And another is Michelangelo's Medicine, How Redefining the Human Body Will Transform Health and Healthcare. His uh, website is healthrevolution.org. Anoop, welcome to the program. Thanks, Buck. It's good to be here with you. So let's just jump right into it. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, the focus of this show largely has been really focusing on, you know, mostly the just the hard science and data driven uh, aspects of longevity and, you know, health span and that kind of thing. Well, let's take a step back. I mean, first of all, it sounds to me like a part of uh, what has shaped your uh, perspective is something that happened uh, in medical school. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a pretty dramatic experience when I was in medical school and actually home on vacation in my bedroom and was reading something and, um, something totally unexpected happened where it just felt like literally a bomb went off in the room. Uh, and it's funny when I go back and I, I've talked about this before, some people, uh, write in the comments, basically what happened is he dropped acid or he was doing <laughs> drugs or something. Uh-huh. But none of that was actually the case. I was, I was stone cold sober and, um, yeah, essentially a, a huge explosion went off and I was just sitting, everything fell away. The room fell away, the body fell away. And it was as if I was sitting in this blazing orange, brilliant light. Um, and it was this timeless kind of experience that lasted X amount of time. Don't really know. And then had an option to leave the lifetime. It was a very clear choice to leave the body, leave everything. And I, I knew if I took another step forward, that was it. And then out of this light emerged this, this being of light and basically instilled in my mind that, you know, that this wouldn't be fair, that there's still work to do and a few things like that, uh, which made me hesitate as I was, as I was supposed to take that next step, you know, uh, and that hesitation uh, in that moment, everything re-imploded, so to speak. And there I was back sitting in, you know, uh, my parents' house in my bedroom and everything had changed. The way I perceive change, uh, the way thought happens change. Actually, be interested to talk to you as a trained neurosurgeon about some of this. I talked to one other neurosurgeon about this um, and had to, in a sense, relearn everything. Like reading, walking. I know it mm-hmm. sounds strange, but that's what it was like um, for a while. Especially once I, start, I started my training in emergency medicine soon after that. Um, and, you know, it it took a few years of integrating to function in a, I guess, in a different way. Do, do you have a, I mean, an idea, I mean, like just stepping away from the experience itself, physiologically, what was happening? I mean, did you truly have some kind of near death experience that from a, from, you know, from a physiologic standpoint or was this purely a mental thing or? Yeah. So, well, ultimately I get to questioning what all these, words mean physical, mental. Yeah, yeah, sure. You kind of make them up, but essentially um, the body was not at risk. Let's put it that way. The body was perfectly healthy, you know, yeah. sitting in a room, reading a book, uh, et cetera. And subsequently, as I started to learn about these things, it's technically called a near death like experience because bodily death was not what caused it. Um, although if I had taken one more step, the body would have died. And I often kind of imagine what the newspapers would have said, you know, medical student overdoses or commit suicide or who knows what it would have said in the papers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, it's technically a near death like experience because the death of the body is not what precipitated it. OK, got it. OK, well, let's let's talk about, uh, you know, what sort of ensued and sort of some of the thought processes that this resulted in and and you know maybe this leads into the you know this concept of the four engines um but uh, i don't i don't want to lead you uh if there's something before that you think is uh, useful to set this up i guess it it depends on the audience but I, i would say i would say that immediately for some time afterwards there was a very dramatic change like i said like 
when, when I looked around, it primarily didn't look like I was looking from within the body. Um, and it was like I could assume any different perspective on the room or expand beyond the room. Mm -hmm. um, things did not look like independent objects. They looked like vibrations or mm -hmm. they looked like, um, uh, I would say, mentation. They essentially looked like mentation and they felt like mentation. They felt as if they were a part of my body. So the thing I would see out there and I've, I've read people on LSD and, and other drugs, they describe similar things, psychedelic experiences. Sure. It felt like it was uh, my body and um, everything was made out of light. So as opposed to light coming from a source like the sun or the light bulb, um, light was the nature of things and it kind of crystallized as space and objects and things like that. And of course, myself as well. Got it. Um, and then slowly what happened is this kind of faded into the background over time uh, because that was more towards the end of medical school. You know, the, the hard stuff was over. It was, it was more just kind of like cruising at that end. And then, but then when I started my internship in emergency medicine, um, then it became quite hard because now many things I didn't realize came forth. Like I became ultra sensitive, which I didn't really know before because I wasn't in harrowing environments. But now you get your level one traumas coming in and then your sepsis and your MIs and all this. And now all of a sudden my sensitivity, I realized was a hundred fold and I had to figure out how to integrate that. And so all of that that was in the background started coming to the foreground and then began the work, you know, the real work of being like, okay, either I exit society and live like, you know, in, in some other, like in a forest or a cave or whatever right, I do. Right. Or I, I, I medicate myself and try to pretend this isn't real. None of this is happening and subscribe to the biomedical physicalist paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, or I embark on a lifetime process of integration and communication and developing a language. And I chose the third. Okay. Okay. And that's what, and so let's talk about that. Cause I think the language, uh, part of that language are the the four engines, maybe you can tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah. Can we get a little bit more radical and talk about the three minds first? Is sure. Right. Or, sure. Okay. Totally. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, because the three minds is, is more fundamental. Uh, the four engines are more about a practice as to how to integrate and, and not just for what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's really for anything. Um, but the three minds is quite a radical framework if your audience wants to hear sure. that. So let's hear it. Let me just put it out there. I think it's worth, uh, and let me just say, Buck, that I think it's really important that, that, you know, this is an ER doc who's trained in bread and butter allopathy. Yeah. I never trained in alternative medicine. I never trained in um, hypnotherapy. I never trained in anything else. And I think those are perfectly valid. Sure. But what I'm saying is like there was, I was steeped in um, Advaita Vedanta, the philosophy of non-duality as a kid. Uh, but, you know, that's not my formal training. That's just what I was studying on my own. So I want to put that out there. Sure. All that to say that, to me, this is entirely compatible with science and entirely rationalist. So okay. the Three Minds framework essentially suggests the the bedrock principle is that the whole idea that the physical world is primary um, is a misconception. That what is fundamental is mentality and fundamentally consciousness. The problem with that is we don't know what consciousness is in our society. We tend to think of it as like one individual's thoughts or what they're aware of. But consciousness continues in dream. It continues in sleep. It continues in coma. So what we're talking about is consciousness is something far beyond the usual concept conceptualization. In the first mind configuration, these three configurations, first mind, second mind, third mind, are orientations of consciousness, of whatever is fundamental, which represents itself as matter, as body, as dream, emotion, thought, perception, memory, everything, love, fear, time, space, dimensionality. In the first mind configuration, the experience of consciousness is that what I am is a localized thing. So I am a noop and you are buck, and that's mm -hmm. the end of the story. Okay. And you are either contained in your body or near your body or within your body, and that's it, all right? And what happens in this frame of consciousness is that because I experience myself this way, I experience the world as a series of things too. Basically, I take myself as a thing so that I see a series of things. And if you look around, what you will likely see, whoever's listening to this, you, you will see a whole bunch of things. You'll see a screen, you'll see a keyboard, you'll see sure. a ceiling, you might see a tree, etc. And what we're saying is that lens, that refracting lens of identity is what shows itself, represents itself as the world on this canvas of consciousness. That's the mm -hmm. first mind view. That is standard in society. That is where almost all science operates from, which is why we try to minimize bias, because right. we think that bias 
does not show us what's really there, but we don't realize that bias is what is revealing what is there, actually. It's the lens mm-hmm. through which we look. Um, so that's one. The second okay. mind view is the experience that what I am fundamentally is not localized to this body and it's not a particular thing. So the experience is much more vast and spacious. And within this vast, spacious experience, we have dimensions, we have worlds, and we have ourselves as individuals. We have the body of Buck, the body of Anoop, the brain of Buck, the brain of Anoop, the personality of Buck, the personality of Anoop, and so on. The fundamental difference between the first mind and second mind configuration and experience of life is that we are not restricted to a small idea of what we are. We can still express through a body, express through English, express through personality, but we are not restricted to that. And we are not restricted to one lifetime. We realize that there is a series of experiences and what we're doing is shining the focus on one particular experience and telling that story, which is the first mind worldview. The third mind then is basically this potential itself, this pure potential itself, which is what localizes and non-localizes as all the individual experiences, dimensions of this world. So essentially what we're saying is consciousness is fundamental. It occurs in three distinct configurations. And in each configuration, the world looks radically different. Your science is different. And your experience of who you are and what is possible is different. So are these uh, progressions then? Are these progressions that a person would go through? Or a a person just, you know, is kind of stuck in one of these? Uh, How does it work? Right. We can say they are progressions. Yeah, they are progressions. Certainly not stuck to any of these. All of us exist at all of these levels, right? There's no spiritual person. There's no special person. There's no adept that is, that is you know, doing it really in a fancy, beautiful, amazing way. Everybody exists at all these levels. The only thing is what frame are we looking through, right? Just like as human beings, we are looking through the brain, right? We mm-hmm. know that the brain perceives an infinitesimal fraction of all the stimuli that are here. We don't see radio waves, we don't see ultraviolet, and on and on and on and on, right? Right. So there's a lens that we're looking through. We never think about it. We think we see the world, but we don't. We see a tiny fraction of what is actually here. Mm-hmm. So similarly, the first mind is, is are certain blinders, we could say, or restrictions or limitations, biological frames, eyes, nose, etc., through which we experience whatever it is that is here. That doesn't mean that we exist at only that level. No, that's why people have things like intuition. Was that real? ESP, was that real? And there are all these crazy stories, reincarnation, all the stuff that sounds strange. Why? Because we're looking through this lens. Even though we're existing beyond this lens, we're only talking about through this lens. Right. And so, you know, uh, some of the the language you're using, it sounds familiar to me, like in the, in, in concepts, um, meditation concepts um yeah. when you hear about in positive psychology and fundamental well-being and yeah. you know people essentially the ability to sort of transition from one phase to another and often that yeah. vehicle that's used there is meditation is that kind of your um is that kind of where your your you your uh, mindset is here are you the way you're going you're certainly certainly a lot of overlap in terminology. Now, the word meditation means a million things. Sure, sure. Um, but ultimately, if you look at the core aspect of meditation, what it's supposed to do is basically take off the blinders. It increases your awareness, to put it very simply. Yeah. And usually it does that by going into the subjective aspect of experience. Every experience you have is an objective pull and a subjective pull. And generally in our society, especially in Western society, the subjective pole is minimized and we tend to look at the world through the objective pole. But of course, it, to put it crudely, it's at least 50-50 because you can't see anything without what you are seeing with. If you, if you don't adjust the stage of the microscope, you'll totally miss the paramecium. It'll be like it doesn't even exist, right? right. So the lens is at least 50% of the picture. And in meditation, what you do is you go in and start to look at the lens. And so what you see starts to widen. When it widens enough and it stabilizes, there's a shift in identity. And that is the second mind stage. Yeah. Okay. So what, so is the, let me ask you this. So is this, what's the, your, your take is that people should be, um, what will this result in for people? What, it, what is the outcome? that maybe maybe they will achieve if they you know 
try to look through these other lenses? The biggest thing is uh, a deep peace, a deep resolution, an internal resolution. Like even, even people that aren't looking for a resolution, if this is not seen and recognized, there will be an internal conflict and an internal strife. Because, again, the hypothesis I'm putting forth is that everybody exists at all of these levels. This is not something special. And so if I, if I believe that what I am is a pinky, right? I exist as the whole body, but my whole society and everything just talks about the pinky all day long. So I think, okay, I'm, a th- I'm, the, I'm the nail, I'm this joint, I'm this joint, I'm the skin. But yeah. I'll always feel like, you know, there's something more. I don't know. There's just something more, right? Yeah, of course there's something more. There's the whole organism more, right? Mm-hmm. And it's exactly like that. And when you see the whole organism, you just be like, oh, yeah, not to mention your capacity will go up a hundredfold. That, let alone those practical things, just from a fundamental level, peace, clarity, depth, understanding, all of this goes up several fold. I would be careful though. I would not say everybody should do this. Everybody should experience this for a couple of reasons. Number one, to me, this is not about self-improvement or self-help, okay? This is about a person who simply wants to know themselves. Like, mm-hmm. hey, I wanna know what this world is. You know, curiosity. I, mm-hmm. I, I want to know what I, I think there's more to this stuff. Some people say it strangely. I just want to know what this is. Right. Mm-hmm. Then I invite you to be curious and to consider this perspective and consider practices that might tell you in your own laboratory, whether it's for you or not. That's all. If not, don't worry. It'll come at some time in this lifetime or the next. That's a separate story. All right. Yeah. Now, the other aspect that I would caution people about is that there is no way to make this shift without facing every belief you have ever believed, whether it was in Sunday school, at your church, in your mosque, in your temple, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, whether you're atheist or agnostic or religious, whether you hate spirituality or love spirituality, scientist, non-scientist, it all goes out the window, right? I'll give you an example. There's nothing scientific about me rubbing my fingers here together. Yeah. Right. I can look at it scientifically. I can talk about the skin cells or I can talk about the energy field surrounding the fingers. I can make it scientific. But fundamentally, this is just a plain old experience of me rubbing my fingers. I can talk about it through science, through philosophies, through spirituality. But it's just this. And that's how it is for everything else. Eating dinner is just eating dinner. It's not spirituality or science until you make it that. This, too, is not spirituality. It's not science. It's none of that stuff. It's just Literally what you see, how you see, how you feel, if you think, it's so fundamental, it's perceptual, it's your sense of identity. And so at some point, a lot of the argumentation around this is because a lot of people don't want to challenge some of the things they learned when they were five or 10 or some other time or their professional degree, the group think. A lot of this stuff comes into play. So just know that as you embark on this exploration, these things do have to be integrated and reconciled. Got it. You, I mean, you mentioned in, in your own life that you, you know, as a kid studying non-duality, I mean, that's not typical, right? I mean, yeah. so, yeah. so to a certain extent, you, your, your brain is primed for this. If you've been, yes. you know, you've been studying these kinds of concepts for those who do want to do this stuff. And I'm curious about this because frankly, you know, I have been um, getting, in meditation and focusing on, you know, these, some of these positive psychology things and, you know, trying to experience joy and fundamental well being, all that kind of stuff. I feel like I'm uh, personally feel like, man, I'm really dense because I try hard and it seems like sometimes others, you know, have this, you know, automatically in their medical school dorm room lying there Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. how do you ex- how do you explain that? I mean, at a fi- maybe at a physiologic level are some people just wired differently. And is it your belief that if you want to access this world, that it's pretty much everybody can? Uh, the latter. Yes. If you want to see this, uh, you, you can. Um, everybody's process is different. Um, if you personally want to, I'm happy to have a series of conversations with you. For some people, it's a matter of letting the walls down, you know, because there's, there's so much, I'm not saying this is your case. I'm just saying for some people, there's so, there's so many concepts and, and 
Another thing is like in many ways, the more educated you are, the greater your walls. Yeah. Right? Because, because, because our identity, our salary, our sense of respect, everything is based on these world views. And it can, subconsciously, it can be very scary to kind of let these things go, which is what has to happen to basically see the fuller picture, mm -hmm. right? So yes, everybody can experience it. The process is a little bit different for everyone. Mm -hmm. How about the wiring side? Do you think some people are just wired differently and able to, you know, kind of get into their own? Yeah, it, my view is that my um, exposure to Advaita as a child and growing up actually had nothing to do with the experience. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll explain that because that that's that's an unusual statement. Um, but I can tell you that when this shift happened, it was no less radical or different because of what I had studied. Because I, again, studying is in the form of concepts and studying is in the form of even experimentation. I did do some experimentation. I had experimented mm -hmm. a lot with meditation and with techniques that I was different. I was doing uh -huh. to start massaging that mind and opening up that mind. However, when this shift happened, there's nothing in my past that would have said, this is what they were all talking about, right? right? It's only in retrospect after that, I said, oh, okay, this is what, and even that took a while because even correlating concepts to this probably took at least months to years before I even started thinking about it in certain terms. So I don't think that caused this we're getting into bigger themes here, right? So people have, people come into a lifetime for a reason. Um, so, and everybody has their reasons. One of my reasons was to communicate. And so in my early life, I went through a pretty extensive kind of training to have a certain concept, conceptual framework and language that I could tack on to an experience that I could correlate with experiences and then be able to talk about it. So that was more about communicating and training rather than actually experiencing and knowing what the heck I was talking about. So that's why right. I say one did not lead to the other. Um, in terms of wiring, whether one is pre-wired, yes, in the sense of what I said, is that people come into a lifetime with a certain kinds of motives to be done. And if this is one of them, then this will come into your life. So anybody who's listening to this, if you have interest, some people will be like, this is crazy. Some people will be like, hmm, I don't know. Some people will say, I need to know more about this, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in the, I need to more about the, know more about this, you can be sure this is on your path, right? That is why that attraction is there mm -hmm. and so on for, for different levels of interest. So yes, the, the general answer is yes, there is a kind of wiring to it, but the wiring is a result. The wiring is not the cause. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about um, how this shapes your practice, um, or at least your view of, of medicine. The biggest thing is that our model of human anatomy is radically incomplete. We believe, and when you say this out loud, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but we believe that you can adequately model a human being by putting little balls together that we call particles. And if you treat those little balls in the right way, you can solve their problems. This is the insanity of our philosophy in medicine. It's an undeclared philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. So surgery is working on the particles at a gross level, at the gross anatomical level, mm -hmm. right? Pharmaceutical drugs are about rearranging particles, or par rearranging neurotransmitters. Everything we do in allopathic medicine is based on our model of anatomy, right? When somebody comes and complains of a cough, what do you think of? You think of the nasopharynx, the throat, the trachea, the yep. chest, the lungs. So it's the anatomy that we map to the patient's presentation. And we have this crazy idea that a human being and a human body are the same thing. But uh, 10 seconds after death happens, the body is the same before and after death. But you mm -hmm. have a totally different human being. Right. And we have no model for that. This is the craziness in our system. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is complete our model of human anatomy. The problem is that we have subscribed to the philosophy of physicalism and nobody ever told us that. You weren't told in medical school that we were going to teach you physicalism. I wasn't told. Nobody's taught that. But we're all taught that starting in first grade, right? Even, even starting when we're a few months yep. old, when our parents are telling us, these are your eyes, this is your nose, this is your mouth. We start to constrict our experience of identity to these physical characteristics. And then that gets rewarded later on with salaries and money and prestige. So 
if we can complete our model of anatomy, if we can step back and say, hey, we don't really know about this so-called mind-body connection. What does that really mean? What is the mind? We need to complete that model and show that there is a layer of the human being that is physical, no doubt. But there is a layer of the human being that is mental, the mental body. There is a layer of the human being that's energetic, that's described in detail in Ayurveda and yoga and traditional Chinese medicine. Why don't we understand it? Because we haven't clarified the subjective lens and done the introspection to see these structures. Mm -hmm. There is a layer that's informational and then at the core of the human experience and the core of the cosmos is this fundamental potential that I'm calling non-local consciousness. Mm -hmm. These are the layers of the human being, physical, mental, energetic, informational, and consciousness. If you do this, you give people so many more tools to heal. Mm -hmm. you, have, you can have such a range of diagnoses and if it doesn't work for you, throw it out. Yeah. But so you're not certainly not rejecting allopathic. Of course you know, not. Right. Right. Of and that, that's one of the, to. that's one of the things that always makes me nervous, which is certainly not yeah. opposed to any of the things that you're talking about. But I do think yeah. that there is an element of extremism sometimes out there. You know, if, yes. if you're even just, you know, if you're trying to treat your own pancreatic cancer, that's advanced yeah. uh, with, with, yeah. uh, you know, just mental energy, it's, I wouldn't advise right. it. So, right. And, 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 you know, it's, it, it's a matter of what these words mean. So even, uh, even now we know in physics that the physical world is essentially energy. We know right. that. Right. right. But, but there is an arrogance in science that says, well, that's one kind of energy, but the energy, these mind body talk, well, they're talking about something else. Well, guess what? Nobody really knows what energy is fundamentally. Mm -hmm. And we don't understand the connection between the subjective and the objective world. So a degree of humility is needed here. But absolutely, that's why I say I'm bread and butter emergency medicine. I think emergency medicine is amazing for what we do, but we have to understand what we apply it for. And if we believe that it's primary medicine and this is the primary way to treat things, you're going to have a world of sickness as we do. If we understand that emergency medicine and allopathy is complementary medicine, meaning that they're complementary to the four engines of nutrition, movement, connection, and rest, then you're going to have people who actually heal from diseases and get it better and use allopathy wonderfully like it's supposed to be used. So talk a little bit about those engines. Sure. So these four engines actually came about nutrition, movement, connection, and rest um, because I was having a difficult time. After this shift happened, you know, uh, to be in the world, especially to be in emergency medicine, uh, was difficult. So I started experimenting. What are the things I need to be able to integrate these worldviews and, and see the world as one thing and not have to compartmentalize myself and cut mm -hmm. myself off from certain mm -hmm. experiences. And so I found um, number one is nutrition, specifically nutrition of the mind. Each of these four engines applies across the body and the mind. Nutrition of the mind is what we're doing now. It's basically simply having the courage to have the conversations and listen to different narratives. Hopefully narratives that don't cut anything out, that don't say, don't do that ever, that has no place here. It's not about that. It's about narratives that are inclusive, that say, okay, this works. It works in this setting. What else works? What's the broader picture? What am I not seeing by looking at this, right? What, is, what does the group think say, right? What do other people say? So it's this openness to conversation without having to reject one thing or accept another thing. It's looking into your own experience. Mm -hmm. So this is nutrition of the mind. Nutrition of the body, uh, plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables and cutting out processed foods. You know, there's so much talk about diets and food and all that stuff. And there's such a range of them, right? You, you yeah. know, there's such a range of nutrition plans. But I can guarantee you, other than some big industry company, nobody's going to tell you to eat processed food. Right. <laughs> just, that's just not, that's just not, it's not food essentially, right? Right. So that's number one. Cutting out processed food, I think, will will cut out probably 30% to 50% of diseases. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's so rampant now, especially in the United States. So cutting out processed foods and eating plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables. Very simple approach to nutrition. Movement. Movement is many fold. Movement is actually one of the most powerful. Of course, exercise. We know about exercise. Everybody talks about exercise. But there are critical components to movement that are not just exercise. One is range of motion. Right. So maybe you can't go out and, and, and run every day for whatever reason. But most people have range of motion. Every single joint you have use its full range of motion every day. Take the time to take every single range of every single joint through its range of motion. Remember, from a second mind perspective, the body is the flow of the mind. So mm -hmm. the more you move your body, every single joint that has a correlate in the mind in terms of open mindedness, recognition, awareness, depth and so on. 
So make sure, and of course it has physical benefits, basically lubricating your joints and using them. So sure. range of motion is another aspect of movement. The other one is emotional movement, critical, mm-hmm. trauma, adverse childhood experiences. So many people I've interviewed on our podcast that have healed. Crohn's disease has gone away, ulcerative colitis has gone away, um, rheumatoid arthritis has gone away. So many things just from looking at childhood experiences, being guided through that and releasing that. Because again, no human being has ever found the line dividing the mind and the body right. as much as it's talked about in so many ways, because there is no line. The body is the flowing mind, subconscious sure. and conscious. Mm-hmm. So movement is critical of emotions. Then movement of creativity, right? So you, I believe you were trained in, as neurosurgeon, right? But here you are in, I think, real estate or in investing podcast. Why? Because that's your, that's your, that's what moves you, Right. That's your creativity. That's it's called ADD. There's my diagnosis right there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I call that you like to do a lot of things. I like to do a lot of things. Bringing new conversations, right? Right. right. So right. you got to do what you got to do, right? Mm-hmm. That's movement of your talent, movement of your innovation, movement mm-hmm. of your creativity. Not just sit at your desk and, and do what everybody else is doing. If you love it, do it. If you don't, find what find what moves you and do that, right. you know? Right. And then movement of the breath, right? In the ER, you can see it. Anybody who's breathing shallow and fast is going to be anxious, right? It's a very clear correlation. Anybody who's breathing deep and slow, it's very difficult to be anxious if you're if you're deep and slow. And if you have two people who meet shallow and fast and deep and slow, somebody will gravitate to the other. They're not going to maintain their breathing patterns. Mm-hmm. In other words, one mind is influencing the other. So breathing fully with the diaphragm fully contracting, expanding the thorax, you know, the, the full motion of breathing rather than just kind of chest breathing right. is a critical aspect of movement. And that breath really connects the mind and the body as we talked about. So that's nutrition and movement. Connection is threefold. Connecting with others as we're doing, which is basically sharing your stories. Hey, this went well, this didn't go well. I heard this, it sounds it sounds kind of wild, sounds kind of cool. Sharing with others, just connecting with others. Mm-hmm. Critical component, we're social beings, right? Connecting with ourself, the deep questions, who am I? You know, where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? What is this world, right? That physics is talking about that disappears into energy and all like, this is crazy. What is it, right? These deep questions that everybody has, whether we voice them or not, these are, these are questions of wonderment, you know, that reside deep within each person. So take the time to ask the questions. It's not about getting an answer. Ask the questions, live the questions, walk the questions, you know, and and see where it leads you. And then that's connection with oneself. And of course, love is a big part of connection. I mean, it's huge. The ability to accept myself as I am. Mm -hmm. I'm a flawed person. I'm a great person. You know, I can do great things and I do some bad things. You know, the ability to hold these polarities and still accept that, you know, I am right. this creature on this planet doing what I can do. That that love is so critical. So connection with others, connection with self. And then I think one of the biggest biohacks in existence <laughs> is connecting with the planet. And uh-huh. by that, I mean direct contact, just like you would put your charger directly into your phone, feet in the soil, electron transfer. Like getting out body. nature, you mean, essentially? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So feet in the, but not just being in nature, how you're in nature. So feet literally touching the soil. Because no shoes. Transfer. No shoes, right. So either in the ocean okay. or the creek or the grass or the soil, whatever it is, you get electron transfer between the body and the planet, which is never talked about. And there mm. are studies showing decreased inflammation in the body when that electron transfer is happening. So feet in the soil, sun on the skin, fresh air in the lungs. It's all about direct contact, right? Fresh mm-hmm. air contacting your lungs. And I like to say eyes on the sky because again, when you look at this level around, what you see is multiplicity. You see object after object after object, innumerable Mm. objects. But when you look at the sky, you see one. And there is something powerful that does something to the human system if you look at the sky. There is a settling effect. There is a grounding effect Mm -hmm. because we are literally contacting the planet and not just the things that we have created on the planet, which is what happens on the horizontal view. So this is connection, you know, connecting with ourselves, with the planet and with others. And finally, the fourth engine, rest. Of course, sleep. Everybody talks about the importance of sleep, no doubt about it. But actually more fundamental than sleep is rest, right? Because sleep is a kind of rest. Rest is not a kind of sleep. 
Sleep is a kind of rest. What happens when we sleep is the mind sleeps. The body doesn't sleep. The body's doing its thing, right? It's it's filtering toxins and it's, mm-hmm. its immune system is functioning. It's doing all kinds of things. But the mind sleeps. I'm not talking about dream. Dream, the mind is working again. But in sleep, the mind just goes shut down, mm-hmm. right? And what happens in that state is that that mind gets into a deep rest. It gets recharged for the next day. That's why the next day, sometimes if you, even if you get a few hours of sleep, you can be very refreshed because the mind completely shut down and recharged. So the key is that even when we're awake, we can learn how to keep the mind at rest. That's, that's the secret sauce. So if a mind can be at rest, even when it's active, even when it's communicating or doing what it has to do during the day, if it still has a vision and an experience of where it comes from, of that depth of sleep from which it emerges during the day and to which it goes back, then that mind is much more at rest and that contributes to health and healing as well. Got it. So those are the four engines, nutrition, movement, connection, and rest. Very interesting stuff. And you know, the thing is that none of what you've talked about is actually, you know, is, uh, you know, is that it's butting heads with allopathic medicine. I mean, frankly, right. you know, you're talking about nutrition and talking about effectively we have different words for it like exercise and and uh you know we might be monitoring our sleep with an aura ring to see how much deep non-rem sleep you get but effectively we're kind of looking at some of the same things uh through a different framework um and and i think your point is that the framework you're using is a broader framework and and i think that's uh that's reasonable what? And it, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a process, right? So the four engines, um, you can look at it, if you're a teenager and you, know, you, want, you want to do better in school or your, your relationships or you want more um, insight, it, it's the four engines that are going to do it. If you're an adult with a diagnosis and you want to figure out how, can I, how might, I, might I be able to reverse that diagnosis or how can I just feel better, it's the four engines. Yeah. If you just want well-being, right, or you want performance, it's the four engines. Right. If you say, forget all that stuff, I want enlightenment and spirituality, it's the same four engines. That, that's the thing. What you said is true because what works, works. You can right. put it in any framework. Right. What works, works. The problem is it's, it has a marketing problem. It has a branding problem because people think, oh, it's just lifestyle. It's just prevention. And it's not. It's so much more than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about how you practice, you know, specifically, I know you're an ER doc and you're not necessarily talking about this to somebody who comes in with uh, an injury, but, um, but tell us a, a bit about the rest of your practice and the rest of your business, I guess. Yeah. So in the ER, it's more about like, you know, how I am and who I am. You know, I still practice allopathy. I'm not trying to sure. go create a new algorithm. But at the same time, like we said, this doesn't go against anything allopathy. Yep. So I'll talk yep. about nutrition, movement, whatever I feel is important to this person in front of me. I'll talk about that mm-hmm. with them. Um, health revolution on the whole is part of it is inspired by seeing my patients come in and, and almost like imploring me with their eyes, like, you know, what is the answer here? You know, like I'm doing what the doctor is saying or I'm doing what you're supposed to do, but like nothing's actually happening. There's no movement happening. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like we, the truth is the healthcare system benefits off of sickness. That's Mm -hmm. the simple truth, right? So there's no incentive to actually help people heal and become independent of the system. Um, And that's my goal. That's my goal. I think everybody deserves a shot or a framework to help them get better and do whatever it is they wanna do. And if you look at Ayurveda or yoga or Chinese medicine, it's the same principles. It's nutrition, movement, connection, and rest. All the people that I've interviewed who have healed from, I've interviewed maybe 30 to 40 people, whether it's advanced cancer or advanced heart disease or uh, autoimmune disease, whatever it is, it's one of these four, one or more of these four engines. When they activate it, something happens, right? Mm -hmm. So, we need to talk about that. I think that's our first responsibility as healthcare professionals and public health officials. We need to systematize that. So we have a 28 day course, jumpstart course, at four weeks, one week each on each of these engines to help people activate them. And then we have a whole range of other courses with deeper content that talks about the three minds, that talks about a broader view of reality, that talks about what we call mental health and mental illness in an entirely new way. 
it's a way of helping people understand what health actually means mm -hmm. and understand that. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of uh, the ethos of what I'm doing in the longevity space is about um, prevention, right? Um, now, obviously, I have a very strong push towards using technology for early intervention, using what we know in terms of, uh, you know, exercise, lots of exercise early and certain types of, uh, you know, glycemic controls and things like that. But um, this is like kind of a similar approach to that, except in a, I guess, a, a broader, I guess, almost spiritual framework, right? I mean, it, it's kind of yeah. kind of preventative medicine, but it's sort of like in a different, looking at it right. differently. Right. So with a couple key clarifications is that if this were preventative medicine, I couldn't have interviewed the 40 people I interviewed. They actually reversed their well, disease. Well, that's that too, it's that too. Not, right? Having just um, one more thing in your armamentarium. Now, I mean, one of the things I would say on that front too is that um, when we talk about, specifically about like the placebo effect, I've always been fascinated by that because effectively what you're talking about is the ability to, you know, is the ability to self-heal. There is something, usually when we look at the placebo effect in uh, studies, we kind of look at that, we glaze over it, right? Like in the yeah. sense that um, you're you're basically comparing somebody who's had treatment with somebody who thinks they've had treatment, right? Yeah, yeah. And and you're just determining whether something really works by seeing if, if the thing that was real uh, actually did anything. But the funny thing is, if you look at those studies, a lot of times the people in the placebo group actually had improvement as well. So there is obviously some kind of harnessing of, of, of some energy within the mind um, to, to, yes. to affect that. And to me, kind of what you're talking about is interesting uh, in part because it's how do, you, how do you bring out more of that placebo skill you know, that, 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 that ability to self heal or the, the ability to make a difference in your physical yeah. being. Right. I mean, this buck is a huge, huge topic. Um, I, it, it asks so many questions. First of all, when we're talking about treatment, what is the actual treatment? Is it the active ingredient that we think is act, the active ingredient biochemically? Um, is it the act of giving a pill? Right? Is, is it that, that very mm -hmm. action that we all have associated with healing, that pill equals healing, right? As a result of right. whatever over decades marketing and so on, does that action itself stimulate the body to know do what it does? By the way, the body heals from stuff every day, all day. Right. DNA changes, inflammation, sure. um, cuts, scrapes, and bruises that we don't even know that we have, right? I mean, all day long, the body's healing, and, and we still don't know how to do that. What we try to do is create these bridges to the immune system's own ability to heal. So mm -hmm. healing is innate. Everybody is doing it pretty well. Even when things go wrong, that's actually the minority of what's happening with our body. So that's number one. Number two, placebo asks us to question our philosophy, and this gets back to the Three Minds framework. This is why it's rejected in, in most studies and why we look at it the wrong way. If what we call placebo, which is basically the ability of the body to heal, given some stimulus or thought or belief or whatever we want to call it, meaning, system, then what we're saying is that mind and body are not fundamentally different, yeah. right? Or, or that one is directly and deeply connected to it to the point that it actually changes physicality. That's literally what we're saying. Yeah. Right? We don't go there because that contradicts our implicit unexamined philosophy. Yeah. Right? But if you look at, I remember there was a study, I think it was with Zoloft, uh, mm -hmm. the, what we call an antidepressant. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a problem with a lot of these terminologies that we use, but it's used for low mood. And Zoloft and was looked at a lot, and it was a blockbuster drug, right? It was mm -hmm. looked at with um, St. John's wort and I think placebo. It was uh -huh. a three-arm trial. Um, and they found that there actually was no, that people improved with all three. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if what happens with that, the, the headline for that study is basically that um, placebo or St. John's wort is no better than placebo. That's the interpretation, mm -hmm. right? 
but that's not the actual story. The story is placebo works as well as Zoloft, right? Yeah. That's the actual story there. But again, if we actually studied the placebo effect, I think we would see that it is the majority of healing in, in a lot of these, I mean, there are even sham surgeries. I know there are knee yeah, for tennis elbows. In which they make an incision, they don't actually go in, and the yeah. patients do just as well yeah. as the people who actually got the surgery, right? Yeah, and I think we I think the telling. mistake that we make, and maybe we need to kind of drill down on, is I would obviously not go, as, and I don't think you would, as far as to say that there's no benefit to a lot of these medications and pharmaceuticals and that sort of thing by any means. But what what I am fascinated by is you know is there a way to take that placebo effect and augment it right and th that that to me is a, a a really fascinating thing because we know the placebo effect occurs it, it happens there so as you call it, you know it's effectively self-healing of some type of mechanism is there a way to harness harness that is there a way to get into that and 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 leverage it for you know, uh, for healing. And I think that's, I'm guessing that's basically what your, you know, your thesis yes. is. So, well, I mean, there are a couple of things. One, uh, there's good research around that. I think Ted Kapchuk, uh, Wayne Jonas, I believe they both mm -hmm. have done, and there, there are a few others who have done research around it. And what they've discovered that is that it's not just belief. It, it's about like a, a culture uh, of, of meaning, right? So if, I, I think in some studies they've shown that acupuncture works better the closer you are to China, uh -huh. right? Why? Because there's a there's a, a meaning associated with that and, and that's deeply saturated in that culture. And uh -huh. so naturally that, that stimulates that body-mind system towards healing more. Yeah. And if you go to a complete skeptical place and start doing it, it's less likely to happen because there's no meaning in sticking a tiny needle that's supposed to be painful, right? Yeah. That's the meaning associated with it. So I think a lot of it, if you can augment meaning, create a story and experience, think about if you come to the ER for something, what do you see? You see the, the big red emergency sign, you see white coats, you see stethoscopes, it's a ritual, right? You see um, x-ray technicians, you see a CT scanner, you see a needle drawing blood. These are all rituals. Mm -hmm. We don't think of them as rituals, yeah. but that's what they are. And what do those rituals, rituals symbolize? Expertise, knowledge, right? Somebody knows, somebody will take care of me. And all of this starts to stimulate that system. That's what we very um, insufficiently call placebo. Mm -hmm. I don't think placebo is the right word. It's, it's really about what stimulates the healing response. It's yeah. actually a powerful response that all of us have. Right. Um, I would go so far, you said, I, I think medications are some medications are effective. I don't think all are. I think many are not effective and mm -hmm. not more than placebo but they're marketed as such. And you know, if you control the studies, obviously yeah. you're not gonna, like the way you write the headline makes all the difference, right? right? But I do believe some are like, we use succinylcholine in the ER when we have to intubate somebody. It works great, yeah. right? So I, I would I love that drug used appropriately in the right context. But I think what's happened is, you know, so much about drugs is about making money. So yeah. if, even if something, if, if we really understood placebo, many of the drugs would not sell today. Yeah. So um, very uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, again, if we want to learn more about you, uh, it looks like the website is www.healthrevolution.org. Is that right? Is that the best way to? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Um, yes. So Anoop, this has been uh, very interesting. I want to thank you for being on the show and I uh, would love to have you back again sometime. All right. Thanks, Buck. Be right back. Thanks for listening to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. A quick reminder that while I am in fact a surgeon, nothing I say should be construed as medical advice. Now make sure to include your physician in any medical decisions you make. And also, if you're enjoying the show, please make sure to show your support with a like, share, or subscribe. Until next time, this is Buck Joffrey for Sapio with Buck Joffrey.